Dr. Wang uh, to present, please. Thank you. So uh, my name is Eugene. I'm actually a medical student uh, last year from uh, McMaster University in Canada. So we have a bit of a sort of time frame. It's actually 11 a.m. on my side. Uh, but basically, my research is largely to do uh, with a sort of larger uh, study piloted by my, uh, uh, my PI, Dr. Jessica Spence, looking at uh, perioperative benzodiazepine use uh, and its association with postoperative uh, neurocognitive decline. So things like delirium, intraoperative awareness, as well as cognitive decline, which is the focus of this poster. Uh, so regarding you know, some of our parameters and our objectives, uh, it's based off of uh, you know, Society of Critical Care Medicine and the American Geriatric Society's guidelines on, like based on a foundation of uh, not so strong evidence, uh, they recommend you know, benzos be minimized in the elderly and critical care populations. But basically what we wanna do with our, uh, with our investigation is to suss out you know, uh, what are the actual uh, adverse effects with using benzodiazepines perioperatively in regards to you know, the risk versus what they're, the benefits that they have been seen to be used for in terms of anxiolysis, uh, in terms of hemodynamic stability uh, and amnesia. So uh, it was a meta-analysis, including uh, any benzodiazepine used perioperatively compared to non-benzos, uh, any inpatient cardiac and non-cardiac surgery, and for uh, post-operative cognitive decline assessed by any psych validated psychometric uh, measurement. Uh, and so, you know, judging, you can look at the results table and it's a narrative table that kind of tells you a bit about the heterogeneity of the data that we uh, come to find. Um, ultimately, you know, nine studies out of the 17 uh, that we accept, that we included and uh, abstracted data from or suggested that benzodiazepines, uh, patients on perioperative benzos would perform worse on psychomotor and neurocognitive assessments, whereas you know, eight studies found no real significant difference. And it was tough to collate all the, uh, the outcomes together because there, there were so many different types of uh, like psychometric assessments used. The timeline of their usage was not consistent. Some studies only tracked you know, for, for the first six hours postoperatively. Uh, some tracked up until postoperative day three. Uh, some only tracked within 30 minutes uh, in the PACU. And so uh, it's, it's tough to make uh, those comparisons on a time scale basis, as well the actual uh, the uh, psychometric uh, validated uh, studies used to assess a cognitive decline uh, weren't consistent in terms of their reporting, in terms of their, uh, the actual data that could be analyzed. And so uh, ultimately, uh, the only real tentative conclusions we can make at this point is that uh, based on the body of evidence that we have uh, decided to work with, it's, been, it's, it's unclear largely uh, what the association is or if there's an association with perioperative benzo use and uh, postoperative cognitive decline as we've defined it. Uh, in terms of our next steps, uh, finding out and grouping different time frames. Uh, so grouping uh, to make things more consistent and heter and homogenous. Uh, the asset like usage of uh, psychometric assessments at points in time, like the first the first assessment post surgery, the first uh, assessment on post op day one, the first assessment on post op day two, that sort of stuff. Uh, uh, to better. Yeah, to better equalize and homogenize the data so that it can be more accurately interpreted uh, would be our next uh, steps moving forward. But otherwise, uh, based on what we've seen in our evidence as well, uh, there is very little data exploring sort of the long-term side effects of post-operative uh, benzodiazepine administrations uh, in, the, in the methodologies that we've refined. So those are sort of our, our two large conclusions is that uh, you know, it's still unclear at this moment if perioperative benzos are associated with short-term cognitive decline. And overall in the body of literature, there's little data exploring long-term side effects of perioperative benzo use on post-operative cognitive decline. I think the largest time frame we've seen was post-op day three was the last assessment. Great, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, my signal dropped out 
a little bit in the middle there, so, so I missed a couple of things. So I apologise if uh, if I ask uh, what, what seems like a dumb question. Uh, when you so I know you didn't meta analyse um, due to the heterogeneity. What what criteria did you use, and was that was that cl clinic, clinical or statistical heterogeneity? Uh, we were trying to sort out basically uh, like heterogeneity on the aspect of clinical like reports, reports on psychometric uh, testing. So things like like the outcomes ended up not being uh, uh, homogenous in terms of whether they were dichotomous or continuous uh, data points. Uh, some data didn't demonstrate like a score out of an uh, overall score. It demonstrated time until uh, scores returned to baseline. Some scores did not report uh, data. They reported, you know, bullet points on a graph that had to be sort of abstracted visually. Uh, so it wasn't, uh, you know, the data wasn't consistent in terms of how it was reported, in terms of uh, what the actual reports uh, measured in terms of continuous versus dichotomous out outcomes or data points. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, very nice presentation. So the next uh, presentation uh, will be Dr. Hull. Hello, hi. Hi. So my name is Anthony, this is Freddie. We're both junior doctors based in Nottingham. Uh, we carried out a project with Dr. Thanawala, who's one of the consultant anaesthetists. Um, and what we were doing was looking at the anaesthetic factors involved in ACL repair and how it might affect uh, point of discharge. The reason we carried out this project was that we had data from Get It Right First Time showing that our average length of stay was far longer than the national average. So our patients were staying about 1.35 days in general compared to a national average of um, 0.13 days. Um, and getting in line with this uh, national average could save us around £45,000 per year um, and also avoid unnecessary inpatient stays. What we did was we looked at the anaesthetic factors, specifically post-op pain and post-op nausea and vomiting, which we felt most likely to be contributing to uh, delayed discharge. And based on the review, we've tried to recommend simple and practical changes, which we think could help facilitate on the day discharge. We uh, got ethical approval from our local audit department, and then we looked at data for 113 patients who had an ACL repair done um, in the NUH between March 2018 and March 2019. Um, and how we measured the scores afterwards was we looked at the pain and nausea immediately in recovery um, and then at subsequent intervals um, following. I'll pass you to Freddie, he can take you through some of the results we had. So overall, our audit showed that post-operative nausea was well controlled. Only 2% experienced this in recovery and under 10% after. We found pain, however, to be less well controlled. Um, with 43% of patients in recovery experiencing moderate to severe pain, which you can see here on our pie chart. We then looked into um, possible anaesthetic variations in intraoperative analgesia um, to see if we can improve these pain scores in recovery. And we found that only 4% of patients um, had a recorded injection of local anaesthetic. Um, so local anaesthetic infiltration has been shown by recent studies to improve pain control for up to 24 hours following ACL repairs. And the report by Get It Right First Time, um, which is included in the National Day Surgery Delivery Pack, recommends the use of local anaesthetic infiltration um, and or an adductor canal block um, in combination with multimodal analgesia in order to help facilitate an on-the-day discharge. Um, so overall, um, we hope that by um, following these recommendations and um, introducing more local anaesthetic infiltrations or adductor canal blocks in our practice, we can improve pain scores in recovery and help to facilitate a same-day discharge. Thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed. Uh, have you had a chance to share this data with your own department? Yeah, so we've, we've, we've shared it with the supervisor as we've gone along. Um, and yeah, they're aware of the outcomes, yeah. 
and, and uh, but I mean more widely with the you know the, the multidisciplinary team, the the orthopods and um... yeah. So it, sorry, yeah, it's 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 something that we're is is an ongoing process. So we. The, the consultant is talking to the orthopaedic team about it um, in terms of sort of other audits that need to be done, other things that need to be looked into um, and about getting local anaesthetic used more frequently. What we've been finding anecdotally is that it's possible that local anaesthetic has been used um, a bit more, but it's just not always been documented. So it's definitely something that um, there's some area for improvement for. Right. And, and I, I mean, you, you rightly haven't attached statistical significance to what's a relatively um, small study, but you know it's it's, it's very well presented. Um, do, do you think your colleagues will be receptive to change in terms of standardising care al along the lines of the you know underlying principles of getting it right first time? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think with this data in particular, with the higher pain scores, it, it's quite difficult to ignore. Um, I think the only issue we might find is. Um, potential non-anesthetic factors which are causing patients to stay more than the, a day um, and and we're looking at some other things such as IV antibiotics and, and physio um, and whether uh, whether this change along with a few other changes which which may not be anesthetic related can can all come together and and help us reduce length of stay very good. We're, we're just coming up to your six minutes. So, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay, the next presentation uh, is Dr. Rowe. So, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Jennifer Rowe. Um, an anaesthetic trainee in the northwest of England. This audit project was done in July um, in the East Lancashire Hospitals Trust. Um, this trust is split over two sites with the acute and complex services based in Blackburn and elective services based at Burnley General Hospital. In the wake of the first wave of the coronavirus, there was a large collaborative effort to improve out of hours care at Burnley General Hospital by providing an enhanced care unit. So this is essentially a level 1.5, believe between the level of ward care is level one and HDU of level two. Um, so they can manage minor de deviations in physiology, for example, with high flow nasal cannula or peripheral metaraminol. This would hopefully have enable Burnley to remain a clean site, minimizing the perioperative risk of coronavirus for the elective patients there. So the aim of this audit was to assess patient suitability for care at Burnley within the, with the new service in place. I looked at a week of operations done in Blackburn from at the end of September 2019 and um, excluded any major complex operations, paediatric cases and any planned level two post-operative patients. So there were 59 cases done, 50 sets of notes were available, two work sets of notes were incomplete and two patients were planned admissions to post-operative care unit, which left 46 for analysis. The majority of patients were middle-aged men who were slightly overweight, I mean BMI was 27.5 um, and average METS was eight. The majority, so 70% were ASA one and two, um, and more than 8% had less than three comorbidities. The clinical frailty scale was only recorded for 28 patients um, and five of these 28 had a clinical frailty score of more than four, four or more. So overall that meant that about 80% of patients were suitable for Burnley General Hospital. The nine patients who were deemed as unsuitable had um, three had unstable cardiac conditions, one was on home CPAP, two had intrinsic bleeding tendencies and two had multiple comorbidities and a relatively major operation planned. This information then fed into um, developing a standard operating procedure for elective patients and who would be then able to be done at Burnley General Hospital instead of Royal Blackburn. So thank you for listening. Has anyone got any questions? Thank you very much for your presentation.
can I just uh, jump in with the first question, which is what um, I think I understand the level of intervention. So as far as high flow nasal oxygen, but not CPAP, and as far as mataraminol, but no more complicated inotropes or presses. What, what level of monitoring and nursing input did you have? So there were various um, proposals put forward, but it was felt that they would be able to manage arterial lines, but the care would be within certain variables, so up to, say, 15 mils an hour of metaraminol. And I think it was 60% FiO2 on the high flow nasal cannula and anything that deviated from their flow charts and those parameters needed escalating to the person covering. The other aspect to this was that they were going to instigate um, a critical care and outreach practitioner on site, um, whereas as the previous cover out of hours was an RMO who would do 24 hours, and that was registered at 10 on the risk register. So actually by having this extra person who was able to interpret these arterial gases and things to a certain level, it was improving the safety for the rest of the hospital as well. And then they would have a different person to contact in case there was deterioration outside of these parameters. And that, that's the, if you, I understand it wasn't a, a junior doctor, but that's the sort of the medical type supervision. What was the, what was the bedside nursing ratio? So um, initially they were planning a one, two, three for this new enhanced care level. So slightly better. And it, was, it wasn't going to be permanently set up as that. It was to draft nurses in as and when required. So almost to book ahead the patients who you think would benefit from the enhanced care. And then they would ensure that nursing staff was available. So hopefully to utilise resources efficiently. <coughs> Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from other people in the call? Thank you. Uh, I've got one more just before oh, you run away. Sorry, okay, <laughs> yeah. sure. I was just trying to open it up to the floor a bit, but um, <laughs> what, what uh, if escalation is required? So as I understand it, you've got two sites. One of them is a relatively isolated site. Yeah. What, what's the bailout plan? Who, who comes with an ambulance or is there a transfer service? So what, what, what do you do if you have to press the red button? The red, so the maternity site is also present at Burnley. Um, the maternity services, they have a separate maternity anaesthetist with a second on maternity anaesthetist who does 24 hours on corn. And traditionally, they should be available if there is an airway emergency emergency slash catastrophe to um, come and intubate a patient, which would then buy time for the perioperative anaesthetist who would cover the service to be in attendance. I think they were looking at 30 to 45 minutes arrival time for the perioperative anaesthetist. Or the on consultant who traditionally covers Burnley General Hospital to come in and then transfer the patient by ambulance. Great, thank you very much. Very good, thank you. Uh, the next presentation is Dr. O'Riordan. Hi, my name's Eleanor. I'm uh, at SHO and Anesthetics in the Coombe Women's and Infants Hospital. Um, so this is a case report that we did on a patient that um, we did a spinal anesthetic for a C-section on um, about a month ago. So she was a 41 year old lady who was grabbed a 10 power knot. Um, at the time, this is this wasn't during this pregnancy. It was during her previous pregnancy in 2018. Um, so uh, at 28 weeks and three days gestation, she presented to the emergency department here at the Coombe um, with a postural headache, nausea, vomiting, um, visual disturbances. And she was seen by the reg uh, obstetrics reg in the emergency department, um, and she'd been lied down. Uh, for about 30 minutes and the headache had completely resolved so they kind of said that it was just a bad headache and that she should just go home and now when she started sitting up again the headache symptoms returned as did the nausea and vomiting and um, so she decided to go to her out-of-hours GP who referred her into a, a tertiary referral hospital kind of just down the road 
Um, her symptoms were very similar to, I, I guess, anything that you'd see from uh, what we'd see in maternity as a postural puncture headache, but she'd had no epidural or spinal anesthetic, obviously, at this time. Um, and luckily, one of the consultants down in the emergency department had seen something like this before um, and said that he thought she might have had a spontaneous dural tear. Um, they got a CT brain, which showed no nothing, uh, and she was seen by the neurologist the next day um, who diagnosed her with presumed um, spontaneous um, intracranial hypotension and she got uh, she was put on bed rest for two weeks. Now, unfortunately, her symptoms didn't resolve hugely, so she was uh, given an epidural blood patch by the anaesthetist over in that hospital um, and an, got an MRI about two weeks later, which showed kind of the, the, the classic features of um, a spontaneous dural uh, puncture, but no kind of sign of where this had happened or, or maybe what had caused it. Um, from our point of view, the interesting thing about this case is that she was um, brought in then for her C-section about five weeks after she had her um, spinal or after she had her epidural blood patch and received a spinal anaesthetic under one of the consultants here. And um, there was no kind of uh, sequelae to that. She didn't develop a postural headache after this. Um, and in her subsequent pregnancy, she had no issues with dural tears and uh, underwent spinal anaesthetic under us uh, a month ago with with similar with 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 no um, uh, sequelae. Um, the reason that we just wrote up this case is that there's nothing really in the literature about kind of timing of spinal anaesthetic post having an epidural blood patch. It wouldn't be very common that people would be going for them after having an epidural or a spinal. Um, so it, we just sort of wrote it up as uh, as kind of. I guess just to say that we had an experience with one here and it, it, we were able to do a spinal anesthetic safely on this patient um, with no um, sequelae after it. So very short. Great, thank you very much indeed. Um, did, what, what level, um, like what, what were the respective levels of the different interventions? So are we talking all, all in the same place? So is the spinal through yeah. where the blood pressure might have been? Or yeah, yeah. So I, I was able to get her notes from there and they had gone in L3, L4 as well with the with the with the blood patch and we had gone L3, L4 with the spinal as well. So it was in the same place. And um, the only thing that we could have thought could have caused this was that this lady, as you might have noticed, was a grab at a 10. So um, she was seeing an immunologist with a presumed sort of autoimmune disorder and had been on high dose steroids for the first trimester of her pregnancy. Um, so we're thinking maybe there was some thinning of the juror as a cause of that. She'd had a cough two weeks previous as well and had been coughing for about two weeks up to this event. So maybe the increased kind of Valsalva pressure had, had caused the, the spontaneous leap, but we couldn't find any other reason why this might have happened. And as I said, her second pregnancy went without a, without a hitch. Right. And there was no, because uh, one might imagine there would be a degree, there might be some technical difficulty if you've got blood patch and potential scarring, but, but technically it, yeah. it like a normal spinal yeah i spoke to the consultant after obviously it was a consultant who did the spinal anesthetic on on this lady that time it wouldn't be uh, one of the trainees and he said that he just had a look with the ultrasound machine uh saw normal anatomy and felt that it was safe to proceed with with the spinal and she had a good yeah. outcome was able to have the delivery as as you know seeing the baby and everything which is important obviously for her and, and body mass index high, high or normal? No, or? completely normal. She's a very slim lady. She she actually works as a physio, so she was a very fit lady. Mm. Right. Thank you. I mean, it's clearly not, not a very common situation, but interesting no. because you would you would wonder what to do in the, in that situation. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. Thank nice you. presentation. And I'll move on to the next, which is Dr. Fish. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Joanne. I'm an SHO in anesthesia in Cork University Hospital in Southern Ireland. And I conducted a retrospective audit to assess immediate post-operative central and peripheral temperatures on arrival to the intensive care unit following cardiac surgery in CVH. So as you know, hypothermia after cardiac surgery is a key physiological abnormality. Um, there is a significant association, uh, particularly of adverse outcomes when bladder temperatures are less than 36 degrees on arrival to the ICU. And incomplete rewarming of peripheral tissues does tend to create a large temperature gradient between the central and peripheral temperatures, resulting in a redistribution of central heat. Um, so I conducted the, or we conducted the analysis, uh, taking data from the anesthetic and intensive care software. We included patients 
who were post-cardiac or aortic surgery, if it was their first admission into the cardiac ICU, if the data set was complete, and if both uh, central and peripheral temperatures were recorded at the same time. And we identified six patients in total, and we included variables such as the primary bladder temperature and peripheral temperatures, age, gender, and surgery type. It was all recorded on an Excel spreadsheet and analyzed using SPSS. As you can see from the results, 86% of the group were male with a mean age of 66.5 years. The most predominant operation was the coronary artery bypass grafting surgery. Um, and as you can see from the temperatures, uh, patients were mildly hypothermic from a central perspective at 35.3 and peripheral temperatures as low as 30.9 on, on arrival to the ICU. So in conclusion, uh, patients who received cardiac surgery in CUH were mildly hypothermic on immediate post-operative admission to the cardiac intensive care unit. And these significant gradients that we noted between bladder and peripheral temperatures do actually exist. Uh, patients are significantly cooler when compared to normal thermic baselines. So we proposed to introduce the use of temperature controlled heated surgical mats from the rewarming phase onwards set at 38 degrees. We aim to continue standard post-operative convection warmers such as bear huggers and we aim to achieve normal thermic temperatures for patients on arrival to the cardiac intensive care unit. Uh, the, the, the second phase of the audit is currently ongoing at the moment. Thanks very much for your time. I'd like to invite any questions. Thank you very much uh, indeed. What, uh, what was the response to your colleagues when you presented this data to them? Um, yeah, they were quite surprised at the temperature of the patients on, you know, on the, on the first admission to the unit. Um, uh, you know, and I suppose pretty quickly after the, the first part of the audit was conducted, um, we were able to obtain the surgical mats. So, you know, I think it, it really helped to get that kind of going into the ICU. So, you, yeah, you've, al you've already had an impact. And, and you, um, if I understood you correctly, you're now, so you're now implementing the proposed changes one to four at the bottom of your poster and you're going to re audit yeah, afterwards. Yeah, that's correct, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember well when I did cardiac ICU, the whole warm wake wean thing, <laughs> which if you could save someone a W, that would be great. <laughs> um, and, It'll be a lot warmer now. So. Yeah, and, and um, were there any, so I mean, all, all the things you're talking about are, um, I'm sorry, I don't, if everybody could mute because there's a bit of background. Um, but all the things you're talking about are, uh, if you like, responses. Is there any anything that the surgery or the anesthesia, or, or uh, I mean, I guess some of these patients are on bypass. Is there any modification to that? Uh, those techniques that might minimise hypothermia by the end of surgery. I suppose I mean we could have baseline temperature set, you know, at, at the cooling phase, you know, um, when the patients are going on bypass. Maybe if the patients were had a minimum temperature of around 35 degrees to go on bypass, perhaps it would be quicker and easier to, to speed up the rewarming phase after. And that's certainly something that we could look into doing next. Yeah. And any, any questions from other folk on the, um, on the call? Don't hold back. <laughs> I do. Thank you. Uh, are you there, Dr. Shaw? Yep. Yeah. Hi. Thanks very much. Sorry, I'm just uh, getting my. Can you guys see me now? Hi. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, uh, thanks very much. So I'm a I'm a registrar in um, geriatric medicine, uh, working at the Western Hospital District Hospital uh, in North London, and uh, we're looking at um, screening cognitive impairment in our older population undergoing elective surgery. Um, 
over the course of about an eight week period last uh, last year in 2000, summer 2019. The basis for this was a uh, study which has shown that about 25% of older adults presenting to pre op clinics have some evidence of cognitive impairment. And we've used a mini cog, which is a kind of two to three minute brief screening tool to do so. Um, we had a total of about 81 patients in that time frame with an average age of about 75. And a quarter of those had an abnormal mini-cog screening test, uh, which is supportive of uh, cognitive impairment. Um, actually, looking in more detail at those patients, uh, about 40% have an underlying neuropsychiatric condition, most commonly um, dementia. And they're kind of undergoing the same kind of normal operations that we would have expected, like knee replacement, cystoscopy, um, cholecystectomies, et cetera. We kind of looked in and just look, it's not routine practice to screen for delirium on the day of surgery or immediately post-op. Um, and indeed, not many of these patients had any assessment of that. And only one patient had a cognitive screen on the day of surgery and was found to have delirium. The kind of the reason for doing this was just wondering about uh, informed consent in our older adults and whether they do actually have capacity to consent and whether they're consenting them appropriately. And um, none of the patients with an abnormal minicog had an assessment of their capacity to consent documented either in their clinic letters or on their consent form. Um, and when we looked at the type of consent form that was actually used, um, most had a consent one, and actually uh, none had a consent four, which is one you would expect for uh, adults lacking capacity. And the rest mostly had pediatric consent forms done, um, which is clearly not appropriate for an over 65 year old. So I guess um, the conclusion we found is that broadly speaking, our population had prevalences of an abnormal mini or prevalence of cognitive impairment of about one quarter. And uh, quite a lot of those had an underlying neuropsychiatric disorder. Uh, so we feel that those patients should have had an assessment of their capacity to consent documented and then consented appropriately either with a consent form one if they can consent or a consent form four with a family member if they can't. And what we wanted to do to kind of build this up further was then to make sure that those assessments are being done and then start to develop screening for delirium um, pre and post operatively. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so a really interesting question, um, you know, not, not least for the relationship to post-operative delirium, but, but also the, the difficult issues around consent. The, the, mm. the kind of the step between cognitive impairment and capacity. Um, so, so clearly it's yeah. reasonable to assess capacity if you've got evidence of cognitive impairment, but do you have any feel for the proportion of con cognitively impaired who do not have capacity? Unfortunately, um, these are all patients who've only seen uh, a pre-op uh, nurse and seen a surgeon. So um, most don't have anything that we could tease it through. And they're not, it was a kind of a retrospective study, so we've not been able to assess any of these patients ourselves. Um, ideally, what we would hope to do would be to, um, all those people who flag positive is to flag it up to the surgeon um, and to a perioperative consultant to undertake a further assessment of their memory in a more formal way, um, but also to have the surgeons meeting maybe with the patients and the family member and assessing their capacity and, and consenting them appropriately. Yeah, no, understood. I just wondered, I wondered if there's any more, in the, in the literature more broadly, if there's any, because clearly you could be mildly cognitively impaired mm -hmm. and still have capacity. You may be able to process that information, etc. Yeah, and of course- is, is, is there a literature related to it? Not that I'm aware of, uh, although, and I guess it depends on uh, what procedure you're having, um, but no, I'm not sure it's worth having a look. Interesting um, questions. Um, uh, so what are, what are your plans going forward? How will you present this data? How will you, what are you going to uh, So one of the challenges, on? yeah, one of the challenges is that I'm, uh, the perioperative consultant has left and I'm leaving as well. and. A lot of our surgeons are now working off-site at clean sites. Um, so we've had quite a lot of difficulty actually getting traction with getting this moving. So 
the next step really is to present it to a joint at the joint audit meeting uh, whenever that will be uh, and hopefully we'll be appointing a new perioperative consultant and then using that to drive this forward yeah it, i mean it feels like it's something that maybe ought to be on the risk register <laughs> the fact that cognitively impaired patients are not getting having their capacity uh, assessed as yeah, your, and your and managers and executives would be very interested <laughs> yeah absolutely great Th thank you very much thanks. indeed N nice presentation the next presentation is dr farrell hi guys um spelled like the rugby player but i say like the rugby player but spelled a bit different um and i'm talking to you from Galway university hospital in ireland um and the subject of my talk is again based around COVID-19 which is again unfortunately has been um, topical for about a year now and it basically around introducing um, walkie-talkies or a two-way communication device um, to improve communication between COVID and non-COVID teams in ICU, the operating theatre and then hopefully to spread it out to the rest of the hospital um, if, if it goes down well. Essentially as we all know um, Communication is an extremely important part of patient care and issues and problems with communication is associated with adverse, pain, um, adverse outcomes for patients and a, and a um, worsening level of patient care. Coronavirus itself obviously introduces a lot of um, challenges to safe and effective communication. Having you know um, nurses in full PPE by the patient's bedside in ICU while they have um, other nurses outside the um, what, I suppose you could describe as the dirty area and um, running and getting different objects, getting different devices. And then, and also then of course, in emergency situations, um, again, this causing more and more, more of an issue. Um, we found that it, the normal way of communicating, trying to communicate through a glass, through a window or a door, wasn't really very effective and a lot of things were being missed. With that in mind, we introduced walkie talkies, one to be obviously sit in with the nurse in full PP and one outside. Um, into the ICUs and then also into the operating theatres um, for, the, for the theatres that were, were dealing with coronavirus patients. Um, and how we tried to um, gauge interest, gauge satisfaction, and then also to look for the potential issues that was associated with it was um, via auditing the nurses first on what, how they felt communication was an issue prior to the walkie-talkies being introduced, then introducing the walkie-talkies themselves um, and after about a two-month period of using them, again auditing those nurses as well as some NCHDs to see what the what overall what the feeling what the feedback was like. Um, to do this, we used a five-point liquor type questionnaire, um, and it was basically divided into four main sections: one looking at communication issues, another looking at technical issues, and then a comparison between the pre-COVID and COVID communication. And then the final section being on overall user satisfaction. And we also had three open-ended questions um, at the end for which um, staff members could elaborate on, on what they found good or bad about the walkie-talkies. The overall results were um, we had 107 responses between these theatre nurses and ICU slash HDU nurses. Of these 50 nurses, uh, sorry, 50 staff members hadn't used the walkie-talkies, so were excluded. That left 77 um, staff members in total, and 16 were theatre nurses, 26 were ICU nurses, and then there was 35 NCHDs. Um, the overall results we found that were, the bigger point of course, was that 73% of respondents felt that overall the walkie-talkies helped protect staff. By that we essentially mean limiting exposure to staff who weren't appropriately um, doffed or don't, um, sorry, wearing, wearing the appropriate gear. Um, and then other things we found was that 55%, oh, so a slight majority, uh, felt that communication had improved with the new systems. Um, and a majority, 55%, also felt that they should have continued during, the, in, during this coronavirus era and after the coronavirus era, if there ever is an after coronavirus era, I suppose. Um, and 63% found them easy to use. The main issues that, that um, staff members um, identified um, were practical issues mostly, 
Um, these included simple things like the interface of the walkie-talkie and what each button section was meant to do, um, batteries, where to find them, how to change them, um, and also a big issue that we then identified was actually um, the ph phraseology associated with radio frequencies. You know, trying to um, actually take would we were going to plan to bring in training based on it about um, you know when to start, when to stop having phrases to know that you completed your sentence and things like that, again, which will all just really, really um, help recruit the communication. So um, in conclusion, overall, we felt that um, they were popular among staff members, um, both in terms of helping to reduce, um, or sorry, to help protect staff members, and also just as an effective communication method with the challenges that coronavirus faces. But there is some issues which we feel are mostly um, something that we can help improve and change. So we plan on rolling it out more broadly, increasing the number of walkie-talkies that are available, um, and to introduce training for staff members about um, the interface, how to communicate with the walkie-talkies, and um, um, training just generally on how, and how and when to use them appropriately. And then our hope is that after we've introduced the training, we'll then try and resurvey um, staff members again, and um, see if things have improved, and then, and then if possible um perhaps roll it out into the emergency department as well or maybe onto some of the coronavirus wards if we have in hospital and um, so thanks very much for your time and um, i'm happy to answer any questions if there are any questions thank you very much indeed a, a, a couple of practical questions how, how do you how do you initiate the call um so what we're gonna um so introduce yourself and introduce the patient or introduce the staff member to introduce himself and then um just a simple hello um and then at the end of the question either a stop or at the end of the sentence when they're talking either a stop or an over um will be the way that we're planning to do it or do you mean on the, on, on the actual they, um, button itself they, it's they, like there's a dial do they have it on all Sorry? the time how do, how do they know that you want to call no, yeah, there is an on, there is an on off switch on the side of the walkie-talkie. So they've got to know to start with that you want to speak to them. You have to wave at them or something to. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Actually, no. Sorry. It's like the um, I think the receiver receiving the receiving one will be will the radio frequency will be open, but then if you want the, the person, so the the one on the outside will be available all the time. It will be on, and then the, the one on the inside you can turn it on and speak into it, and then it will be heard on the other walkie-talkie. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next presentation is Dr. Snell. Hello, good afternoon. I'm Antonia Snell. I'm an anaesthetic registrar in Newcastle upon Tyne. I'm presenting my um, review today on perioperative hyponatremia in our pre assessment clinic at the Freeman Hospital in Newcastle. Um, recent literature shows that there's variably reported to be some between 7.7 and 23% incidence of hyponatremia within surgical population group. And it has been shown to be an independent risk factor in increasing morbidity, mortality and length of stay for patients perioperatively. We decided that we wanted to have a look at what the nature of the problem was for our pre-assessment clinic. Look at the incidence of the known underlying causes of hyponatremia and look at the impact on surgical outcomes. And we've used the classical BJA um, recommendations with regards to hyponatremic severity, as opposed to any other international um, standards that you might see out there. And they're listed on the poster here. We identified 418 patients coming through our pre-assessment clinic um, who we then interrogated their data further. Um, so we gathered demographic data and pre-morbid fitness status based around BMI, albumin, alcohol intake, we looked at a number of hyponatremic factors. So we looked at a um, number of different medications, um, comorbid disease burden specifically known to be associated with hyponatremia as listed on the table here, um, and some adrenal insufficiencies. And in terms of our post-operative outcomes, we looked at day one post-operative sodium levels, length of stay, 30 day mortality, and post-operative complications. We interrogated the data using Excel. There were a total of 265 of these patients ended up undergoing surgery at the point of data collection, the majority of which were men and the majority of which were undergoing major surgery. Looking at the results, as you can see here, um, the incidence that we found was 
fairly similar in terms of corresponding to previous literature, we found an incidence of 8.6%. So there were 36 patients amongst those 418 amongst our pre-assessment clinic who had a hyponatremia preoperatively. All of these patients had a mild form of hyponatremia falling into that 130 to 135 millimole per litre bracket. And 64% of these patients had an acute form of hyponatremia. Interestingly, 10 of them had a sustained post-operative hyponatremia, but the vast majority of those patients who had pre-operative hyponatremia didn't end up with a post-operative low sodium. And table one um, on the right-hand side here just illustrates the pre-operative to post-operative sodium levels with the red bars indicating patients who were hyponatremic pre-operatively. And you can see that there were those 10 patients there and there were 47 cases in total of patients who were hyponatremic post-operatively within that setting. We found amongst the patients that we had that the hyponatremic patients preoperatively um, tended to be men. They tended to be older, on average about 10 years older than patients who are normatremic, um, so 72 versus 62. And they tended to be undergoing more major surgery, um, of which hepatobiliary and vascular surgery were very commonly represented. They tended to have comorbid disease burden, which is not necessarily unsurprising if you think of the pathophysiology of hyponatremia, um, of which malignancy was perhaps the most common represented within that group, but congestive cardiac failure, CKD, hypothyroidism, and known hyponatremic drugs with regards especially to SSRI use were represented within that group as well. As table one below shows, you can see that if you look along the top panel, we're looking at length of stay, the first first column there is about the hyponatremic patients. Um, so the length of stay on average was eight days versus seven and five for normatremic patient groups. So we certainly saw an increased length of stay for those patients. They tended to have more post-operative morbidity events. So we've got a rate of 8.3% versus 2.5 and 4.5 for normatremic patient groups. And unfortunately, the 30-day mortality was inconclusive. Um, and that was based around the fact that there was one patient who, although that they died, who was in the hyponatremic group, sorry, who, although they died, we couldn't date the death on the electronic record with regards to when the surgery was, unfortunately. And there was one other patient who was not yet 30 days postoperatively. So I'm afraid that should read one rather than two next to the asterisks in the second, um, second line down of the first column there. Um, they didn't tend to have more risky alcohol intake than those who were normatremic, which was quite an interesting outcome. Um, so in terms of the overall summary then for this, um, for this study, um, we found that mild hyponatremia is certainly common, which confirms the previous work that's been done around this. And it's certainly common amongst the pre-assessment um, pre clinic setting for preoperative surgery patients. Um, it's already been shown to be an independent risk factor for increasing length of stay, postoperative morbidity and mortality events, but it also tends to go hand in hand with comorbid disease burden. So although in isolation on its own, in the absence of severe hyponatremia of being less than 125 millimoles or without symptoms, it wouldn't be a flag on its own for increasing your need to have a level of two care or more postoperatively. It's something to bear in mind as an additional risk flag for patients who might you might be reviewing in the preoperative setting and may help add to the other factors that are surrounding the patient the nature of the surgery and the likely risk of complications postoperatively that might review your need for further care postoperatively there are certainly modifiable factors here which could be optimized for preoperative hyponatremia um, where time allows in the preoperative setting and that's certainly of interest to us moving forward with this. So we are looking potentially at a pathway at the moment with some of our colleagues in endocrinology um, to identify particular patients who we might be able to look at for optimising this preoperatively. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Do, do you, um, I mean, of the drugs are an obvious cause uh, mm -hmm. that, that's potentially modifiable. Do you know if... if uh, uh, if, if Addison's or you know subclinical Addison's steroid deficiency is a significant uh, cause within within our group, it wasn't. It's certainly within the literature is they are known to be causes of hyponatremia. And I think if you're investigating these patients, then it's important to make sure that you're looking at um, you're looking at thyroid function, you're looking at um, serum cortisol, and you're excluding those other more severe forms of endocrine dysfunction that are certainly associated to have 
even higher risk for those patients in the pre-active setting and ideally you would want that to be normalized and for them to be seen by endocrine within that setting um, so they're a, spe they're a particular special group within this patient cohort but we certainly didn't see any within our um, patient group even there weren't any patients who we looked at the level of steroid use that they had um, preoperatively and there weren't any identifiable patients who were at risk of Addisonian um, insufficiency. Okay, great, thank you very much. The next presentation, which actually the final presentation in this uh, session is Dr. Fish. Um, hi guys, um, so again I'm Joanne from Cork University Hospital from the anaesthetics department and this uh, review was done, conducted a, a retrospective analysis over 10 years on both the intraoperative and ICU outcomes of complex aortic surgeries. Um, as we know, there's a disparity in hospital mortality among varied institutions over the last decade. So it varies between 6 and 36%. And interestingly, there's also been various modifications in both graft and surgical techniques in this time period. And as such, there are very few papers that report both on the intraoperative and ICU outcomes following these types of operations. So I, um, I reviewed the cardiac database. Um, I isolated patients who underwent aortic surgery for either a root aneurysm or a type A dissection. So they had a root replacement or an interposition tube graft. I identified 92 patients in total, 39 for the root replacement and 53 for the interposition tube graft. Variables reviewed included pathology, operative urgency, hospital mortality, intraoperative temperatures, and post-op ventilation times, as well as complications. As you can see from the results, the majority of the cohort were male, aged, between, aged around 55 years, um, or majority all within sinus rhythm. All patients had both arterial and cent central lines uh, inserted um, preoperatively, and post-induction, a TOE uh, was also performed. What we can see from the data is the mortality for dissection patients was up around 32% and the root replacement due to aneurysm was around 8%. We can see by looking at the operative urgency table, the, I suppose, more emergent the, the operation, the higher the mortality rate, as you would expect. Interestingly, the cross uh, clamp time didn't really show any uh, relationship between mortality um, compared to the uh, pump run time, so the cardiac bypass time. So there were significantly more deaths with longer pump runs. Um, if we look at dissection patients, the net difference between those who survived and those who died was significantly longer compared to those uh, with root replacement operations. Patients, again, who were cooled to significantly lower temperatures tended to fare worse. Uh, both in terms of mortality and longer uh, post-operative ventilation times. So, you know, the, the most hypothermic patients tended to have uh, longer ventilation requirements. Uh, there was a mortality associated with around 69 hours or greater post-operative ventilation. Just under half of the group experienced complications. The most common complication was atrial arrhythmias, namely atrial fibrillation. Um, all treated with IV amiodarone. Um, in conclusion, um, aortic surgery for either root or ascending an aneurysm in CUH does have favourable outcomes in comparison to the documented interventions within the literature, but there's clear evidence to support increased hospital mortality uh, relative, I suppose, both to the, the degree of surgical and the aortic complexities and I suppose the time the patient arrives to the hospital, the recognition in, you know, of, you know, I suppose most people don't tend to think aorta first um, in the emergency department and then how quickly we can get everything in place all has an impact on the outcome for the patient. So certainly follow-up data is required to examine uh, these outcomes in the long term. Thanks very much. I'd like to invite any questions. Great. Thank you very much indeed. How much do you think, so that the bypass time and the temperature, how much is that a reflection of um, the state of the patient before they came to surgery and, and or the type of surgery? So, you know, the, the degree of difficulty and duration of the surgery. Yeah. 
I think it, it obviously the, the more complex the surgery, um, you know, I suppose it's operator dependent as well, but the more complex the surgery, te technically speaking, you know, the, the longer the operation is going to take, the longer the patient's chest is open, um, you, know, the, you know, the cooler the patient is going to be and rewarming takes, as you know, uh, you know a, a set period of time to do. Um, I think if patients present um, earlier to the emergency department, if we get better at picking up um, aortic presentations, whether it's, you know, aneurysm roots or dissections, certainly that will have a better outcome for patients in terms of mortality because you won't need, you know, more complex surgeries. You, you know, you won't need to go down the salvage pathway. Um, and certainly then, you know, if we can warm the patients up quicker, if they're not quite as cold, um, you know, those patients will tend to do better as well. So I think bearing those things in mind is really important. Thank you very much indeed.